The book is called Strip Tease, T-E-E-S, A Memoir of Millennial Los Angeles. It's really an insider's account into American apparel and what was revealed to be the toxic culture of American apparel. But her journey is an interesting one, how she ended up there and then what she saw when she got there. Uh, how about it for our guest, Kate Flannery, everybody. Hi, Kate. Hello. Uh, Hi. Hello, hello, Hi. Kate. Uh, so first of all, congratulations on the book. It's being very well spoken of. Thank you. This is your much. first book, right? It is indeed. It is my debut. Yeah. <laughs> my debut memoir. Tell me uh, about you, because you do talk about this, the, um, the journey that you took. You grew up where? I grew up in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, the the, uh, and, the polar yeah. opposite of Los Angeles, if you know anything right. about northeastern Pennsylvania, Scranton nearby. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, from that place, end up at Bryn Mawr? You went to school at Bryn Mawr? Yes, indeed. I went yeah. to Bryn Mawr, and I, after I graduated, I was a creative writing major. I got a job in Philadelphia working for the headquarters of Urban Outfitters. I was doing their copywriting. I was the Elaine Bennis of Urban Outfitters. I was writing <laughs> their catalogs. I was also writing the text on their website. And while I was there, I really sort of became very disenchanted um, with you know corporate office culture and what it really meant to work in fashion. And I would see in the catalogs, you know, what we were selling something for versus what we were paying some sweatshop to make it. And the whole thing as an idealistic young college graduate really turned me off. Um, it made me really write for the picking for a company like American Apparel that prided itself on being um, a kind of ethical capitalism, if you can believe that. Yeah, I mean, but that is, it, it's interesting because the brand did have uh, nothing but positivity around it for a long time, American Apparel, huh? Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. It seems that the, <laughs> the, the CEO really sort of, you know, he, he can't, he's, he showed his true colors very early on. Um, well, but, but wasn't it celebrated? I, I always saw him uh, talked about, early on I'm talking about American Apparel, as um, a business innovator, as having sort of identified a part of the retail market that no one else really had exploited, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he certainly was innovative and he proved that that system of making everything right here in downtown Los Angeles and paying everyone fairly and not resorting to sweatshops, you could still turn a profit and, um, you know, have fun while doing it and build a huge brand and change the shape of fashion of the moment. Um, he's very innovative, man. Uh, he's a very complex man. Uh, I want to get, uh, I want to double back to American Apparel in a second. Um, but I also want people to know that your profile extends beyond American Apparel and the Elaine Bennis thing. You, um, didn't you, you were in a band, you were in a Little Richard cover band, weren't you also? I mean, you, you're really an interesting person. I was just reading about your, you know, all the different stuff you've been involved in. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Um, post American Apparel. I, um, I'm also a musician. I grew up doing music and singing. And I, um, I found myself uh, starting a Little Richard cover band uh, with <laughs> my friends. And um, we are called Big Dick, which is a play on Little Richard. I'm not like a total deviant naming my band. Got Harry. it. Got it. And um, in an in insane turn of events, um, we ended up having an original member of Little Richard's band, Charles Connor, Charles Keepanock and Connor, legendary drummer, join our band. I really feel like we're like the only cover band that had an original member join. And your, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, your, your uh, obsession, I won't call it, I mean, the word obsession comes to mind, but your, uh, your fandom around Little Richard was owing to, I mean, I see, I'm a fan of Little Richard too. So I always, you know, I don't know how it started. He just seems so, as a kid, I thought, wow, this guy's really just, he's so out there, you know? Yeah, I mean, he is truly the father of rock and roll. Like being in this camp of people that knew him, like even Elvis called Little Richard, you know, the father of rock and roll. He's the real king of rock and roll. Um, uh, and so, you know, my parents are are like silent generation. I was, I'm like the baby of the family, the surprise. 
So I grew up listening to a lot of 50s music. But then um, in the 90s, when I was sort of an adolescent, Little Richard was really having like a renaissance. He was on Pee Wee's Playhouse. He was on Blossom. He was really like doing a lot of, he was sort of having a comeback of sorts. So I grew up with Little Richard in that way too. I've, I and see. I, um, yeah, and through Big Dick, I've met Little Richard. I've gone on stage with him. I've wow. gone backstage with Little Richard when there is no one backstage. I, I was at his second to last show and he was yelling about Big Dick. Like, you know, we got the thumbs up from the man. Like, Big Dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. I love that. I absolutely love it. Well, uh, all right. So, and I'll, I'll double back again to, you know, some of your other endeavors if there's time, but let me, uh, I can so, talk about it all night. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to return to the American apparel thing because your journey then you're, you were saying you're at urban outfitters. You're kind of disappointed with the, the way that they, they sourced a lot of their inventory, et cetera. So you go to American apparel, it was sort of breakthrough, um, kind of label and a business. And then tell tell us, take us on a mini version of the journey that you chronicle in your book. Sure. Um, sort of on a whim, I moved to Los Angeles. I'm like looking for some excitement. I had some friends that moved. And when I got here, uh, copywriting jobs were slim. And just on a night at the bar, I was approached by a beautiful young woman with a card saying, you know, do you need a job? I was like, oh my God, yes, where have you been? Uh, she gave me the spiel on American Apparel and man, did it sound good to me. I went to the factory. I was sold, hook, line, and sinker. I started as a sales, as sales in the very first American Apparel store in Echo Park. And um, sales means you're actually working the floor. Oh, yeah, working the floor, which, yeah. you know, I had just graduated from Bryn Mawr. I was feeling like a snob, you know, oh, I'm a writer. But, you know, they were like, this company is growing so rapidly. Uh, you know, prove yourself here and you'll move on to bigger and better things. And that is what happened um, very shortly thereafter. I um, was uh, started scouting for the company, started hiring. And um, that became my full time job whenever we would open a store in a new city I would fly to that city and hang out and scout hipsters and give them jobs. Well, that's what they were looking for, right? They were looking for a hip crowd. And you talk about that in your book because that's not an incidental point. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, I feel like every every corporation looks for their people. And I, I sometimes American Apparel gets accused of like, oh, we were hiring for attractive people. But that's really not the case, not in my hiring anyway. I looked for people that had experience and would show up on time. And most importantly, that's what separated me as a scout from other scouts in the company. They'd be like, we're looking for that same thing here, Kate. Maybe you could, uh, we can't find either. <laughs> it's very tricky. It's very tricky. Um, uh, but yeah, we were just hiring for people that understood the brand and, uh, excuse me. And um, yeah. So, uh, so so from there, you were on the retail floor. You do rise within the organization, right? Um, yes, I do. I do. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm uh, distracted. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I rose, the rank, I rose through the ranks very quickly after that. Um, and I witnessed a lot of Doug Charney's bad behavior. Um, I should Charney, he's the, he's the, the, give us the profile on him real quick, if you would. He Doug runs Charney. the place. Yes, he is the charismatic, problematic founder of American Apparel, the man with the dream, the man who um, makes it all happen, and who also um, brought the company down at the very end. Right. Uh, so as you, as you rise and you begin to hire all of these people who show up on time and have some experience, and you do see the company expanding right it, it, it's expanding it, it's growing it's you know the the promises that you were given at the bar that night they are being realized from a business standpoint oh absolutely um the thing that's the most amazing about american apparel is that these big business decisions um this company is being run by 19 year old girls with no experience except their own canny knack um, their own sort of natural abilities. You know, all fashion comes from youth culture. Like that's where it starts. That's where fashion trends come from. And Doug Charney is maybe not the most stylish man, but he surrounded himself with youth knowing 
that that's the only way to, you know, feel the pulse of youth. Um, so, yeah. So what happens, Kate? What, what, where does it go south? Well, Dove loved to date his employees, his teenage employees. And um, I was doing a lot of mental gymnastics around that. You know, these were consensual relationships. You know, no one's being branded here, or like the hot yoga guy, you know, like nothing like that is going on. Um, but now, you know, with uh, in hindsight, the dynamics of power and an age difference, you know, he's 35, these girls are in their early, some of them are in their early 20s. You know, you just, uh, there's just too much of a power imbalance there. Well, it was, I mean, and, you know, 35 to, you know, 20s, you know, it does happen. The power imbalance is probably the really disturbing thing. And then you saw stuff beyond that, didn't you? I mean, it was not just the, well, you know, he's older than she is and he's her boss. It it, it got beyond that too, right? Oh, yeah. Very disturbing things. Um, very, strict tease is full of them. Uh, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, I mean, these par parties yeah. and, you know, you, you, know, you yeah. almost had to sign on to various, I'm going to just use, I mean, kink, I guess I'll use that word, to, to be cool at American Apparel. I mean, at least to deal with him. We were sort of enacting the fantasies of a grown man whose libido came about in the 1970s. And so there we were wearing the gym socks and the short shorts and just sort of, you know, that was a realization I came to much later. Um, you know, we just but, looked like the same hustler mags that were on the walls of the store. Like that's what we were So at about. the time you didn't get it, that's what you say when you're doing the mental gymnastics, you were looking the other way or you were just rationalizing it or what was happening at the time? It, you do a lot of that. I know in hindsight, I see such and such. You know, I think that important part of the whole world of American apparel that we haven't talked about is like the cultural canvas of the time, which is the early 2000s, you know, we're post 9-11, we're in the era of the celebrity sex tape and Playboy is back, you know, to have a Playboy spread is, 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 is a big deal. And, um, you know, the girls have gone wild. Uh, you know, young women at the time were really towing the line between sex positivity and, and, and um, sexual liberation and just sexual exploitation. Um, and that that is the sort of environment that made a, a, a place like American Apparel thrive. Because, you know, I thought as a self-proclaimed feminist, I kind of thought we were in a post-feminism world. Like Gloria Steinem had fixed that stuff. You know, uh, AIDS was sort of in the, in, in the background. I grew up with a lot of safe sex messaging in the 90s. And I kind of, you know, not to get too heavy, but like equated like sex and death. And then, you know, by the time I got out of college, I was like, oh, maybe I could have sex and not like die. Um, like that informed a lot of, of, of us girls sort of reclaiming our own sexual autonomy. And there's a lot of really good stuff about that. It's hard for me to condemn American apparel because, um, there's a lot of good things in there too. And that's, that's why the story is so complex. Well, this is really interesting too. I think you can always play that other half of it, you know, um, at least half of it, which is. No, it's about empowerment. I'm in control as the woman. I'm not doing anything I don't want to do. Uh, so to hear you talk about that and kind of contextualize it in that way is, is interesting. So uh, does, uh, does the American apparel story that you tell, does um, it, it really shines a light on that period of time? And then ultimately, of course, on what happened at American apparel and what did happen? Um. Well, you know, uh, my story takes place during my first year of employment, that's Striptease, um, but I stayed there for three years and the company lasted another maybe eight years after that. Um, the company went public in 2008 and that was really started the decline, that and the recession. You know, we have- well, Because like when you have a public company and this is really what happened to them, right? Uh, you please tell me, Kate, uh, but I think that's when you start to have to own these things that you're doing. Your private kink becomes public kink. Yes, and you have disapproving men with money who are not into that. Um, eventually, they uh, shut they 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 shut Dove out, and um, the company really takes a dive after that because without the horny Svengali at the helm, 
uh, the company, uh, you know, couldn't support itself and, and it went down. Uh, another company swooped in to pick up the pieces, Gildan, Gildan Activewear, they're a huge company. They own the intellectual property and the brand. And sadly, they make everything that you can buy American Apparel stuff online, but it's all made in sweatshops overseas. I see. I see. And you go on in your journey. And we talked about Big Dick, the, uh, the Little Richard cover band. And then you're, I think you've done some writing or you participated in RuPaul's uh, uh, Drag Race, right? Yes, that's right. I work on RuPaul's Drag Race. I've worked there for 10 years uh, in the editing department. I'm not a writer there. Um, I'm, a, I, uh, I'm, I'm in the union. I have a really good editing gig there. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I get my health insurance by listening to drag queens talk. Um, well, I mean, so, it's, yeah. and, and even that, the way we look at drag queens in the society has become, I would have thought, um, well, they've almost been mainstreamed, but now you have them being jerked into the limelight in some kind of, um, shaming way by these GOP front runners for, uh, president and, and beyond. I mean, just GOP legislators uh, nationwide, it's become, you know the undoing of America. They can't bring these drag queens into enough conversations. I know it's so true. I, you know, I've always, it's, it's been such a great experience to work for companies where I feel like I'm part of something that's so much bigger. That's why I loved working for American Apparel. You know, we were gonna change the world. And in the same way, I love working for RuPaul's Drag Race. I feel like I'm part of a much bigger, more important uh, battle. It's a great place to work. Uh, any thoughts on the Hollywood strike? Oh, I mean, I'm certainly pro strike. Although now I have a dog in the fight because I sold the film option to striptease. Um, of course, yeah. Right before the strike, like minutes before the strike, practically. Um, so I'm certainly anxious for everyone to um, get moving. Get back to work on your movie. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I stand behind the writers and the actors. They have just been getting the shit end of the stick for way too long. Um, it's really disgusting how greed, it's like the American Apparel story. Greed ruins everything. Give the people what they're worth. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, sadly, it's an inflection moment in a lot of industries and Hollywood is part of it. Kate Flannery, the best selling author of Strip Tees. Congratulations on all the success. How old are you, Kate? I, I am 42. Wow, you have the you have, everything about you is youth, youth, youth. Oh, it's a great I love thing. it. <laughs> yeah. I know that too, Kate, being a youthful person myself. Yes, of uh, course. I um I will have a link to the book, Strip Tease, in the description part of our show. And we wish you all the best and we hope you'll visit again. Again, there's the cover, Kate Flannery's book. Yeah, Strip Tease, a memoir of millennial Los Angeles. What a world you beamed into from Pennsylvania. Very, very cool. Loved having you here. I look forward to it again. Thanks, Mark, Kate. thanks so much for having me. It was so fun. All right. Thanks. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.